Um, every once in a while, someone asks me to write them a letter of recommendation. And sometimes it's wonderful. I know the person well, and I'm like, yep, I'll do it right away. I know exactly what I'm going to say, and it's easy. Some other times, occasionally, it's only happened a few, someone will ask me who I don't really know them. And I don't know what to write about them. And I wonder, why are they even asking me? How can I write them a letter of recommendation? Do they somehow think that my letter of recommendation carries weight anywhere in this world? Like anyone really cares? Why would they want me to do it? There's not much that's impressive about a letter of recommendation from me. Imagine if you needed a letter, letter of recommendation today. Who would you go to? Who would you go to for that letter? You don't want just anyone writing it. You want someone where their letter is going to make an impact. So who is it that you would want? If anybody in the world could write it, who would you want writing that letter? Whose letter of recommendation would you be most proud of? Think about that. It turns out that some of the people in the Corinthian church, which we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks now, Paul is, we're looking at his, one of his letters to a church in a place called Corinth in Greece. And it turns out that some of the people in that church wanted Paul to show them letters of recommendation why they should listen to him or follow what he says. Now keep in mind, this is the church that only exists because Paul traveled on his own time, on his own dime, <laughs> to go and share Jesus with them. He planted this church. He started this church. The only reason they heard about Jesus is because Paul went and shared Jesus with them. And now some of them are saying, you know what, Paul? All the other impressive traveling speakers, they come with letters. All the sophists, all the philosophers, they, they have letters of recommendation from important people so we know we can trust them. How do we know we can trust what you're saying? Why don't you get some letters of recommendation for us? And Paul's reply is going to teach us a few things today, things that you and I can look at our own lives and apply to our own lives. Number one, he's going to talk to them about the recommendation you really want in this world. He's going to talk about how to get that recommendation, because that's an immediate question. If that's the one I really want, how do I get it? Two, another question that'll pop into your mind is, okay, well then, you know, why is this one better than all the rest? So he's going to answer that question. And then he's going to end by talking about the church we want to be. So let's dig in. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You can follow along. And if you've got our app on your phone, you can go there and follow along with the sermon notes. If you don't have our app on your phone, go to your app store, whatever you use, and go to Church Center. Download that app. Look up our church, and you can follow along there. Uh, or on the screen or your own Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be going through in chunks at a time, so I'm not going to have you stand and read through with me today. But we're going to start in verse 1. Here's Paul's re reply to them. And he says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Have you ever heard someone talking about a team saying they look good on paper? You ever heard that expression before? Now, this time of year, after the NFL draft, a lot of people are saying that about football teams. Oh, that's a good-looking team on paper. And inevitably, you'll hear someone say, they look good on paper, but let's see how they perform on the field. Because looking good on paper doesn't win anything. It's how you perform on the field. We use the same phrase to talk about companies. We use the same phrase to talk about investing. This stock looks good on paper, but past performance is no guarantee of future performance, right? So we, we say this all around the place, that with all different kinds of ways, that it looks good on paper, but that doesn't mean it's going to be good. We got to wait and see how it actually performs in reality. On paper doesn't mean much. So then why, when we evaluate our own lives, do we spend so much time looking at the on-paper stuff? We look at our grades, our school manuscripts, our bank accounts, our, the prefixes and suffixes that go around our name. Is it doctor? Is it PhD? Is it master carpenter, attorney at law? 
We look at our resumes. We looked at our LinkedIn profiles, our social media connections. We look at all these things, ink on paper, pixels on screens. None of that stuff is alive, but it's the stuff everyone uses as our letters of recommendation in this world. They wanted Paul to provide papers like that, impressive papers written by impressive people, saying impressive things so that they knew they could trust Paul and what he was saying. And Paul says, I'll do you one better than that. I don't have paper. What I do have is your hearts and my heart. You're a letter of recommendation for me, written by Jesus himself. He says, you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You're the letter. It's written on hearts, your hearts, our hearts, written by Jesus himself. The letter of recommendation that you want in your life is the one that Jesus writes on the lives of the people around you. And Jesus doesn't write it on paper. He doesn't type it into a computer. He doesn't ask ChatGPT to do it for him because it's too hard to figure out what to write like many of you do when someone asks you for a reference. He writes it on hearts, your heart and the heart of the people that you share him with. And so here's the life you can be proud of. When you look at the people around you, your family, your small group that you're in, the people you serve in ministry alongside of, your coworkers, your letter of recommendation is the impact Jesus is having on them through you, on their souls through you. It's not whether you've made them richer or smarter or even happier. It's what Jesus has written on their hearts through you. Do they know Jesus better for having known you? That's the letter of recommendation you want. I want you to think about the lives of some people who are close to you right now. What has Jesus written on their hearts through you? What is written about you in their life? And which letters of reference are you working toward and focusing on, obsessing about the ones written on paper, the ones you can print out and give to an employer, or the one you can post on LinkedIn or wherever else you go? Or is it the one written by Jesus on the hearts and lives of the people around you? Now, two questions should, I think, pop into our minds. They popped into Paul's mind. If that's the letter I want, then how do I get it? And then two, why is that the one I want? Why is that one better? Why is that the one that I can be proud to have more than any other letter in this world? So Paul first takes up, who gets this letter of recommendation from Jesus? So go to verse four. He says, such confidence we have through Christ before God. Confident that, yes, he has a letter of recommendation from Jesus. Verse five, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not one written on paper with letters, but of the Spirit, because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. What competencies earn you or get you and me Jesus' recommendation letter written on human hearts? It's not the competency that comes from you or that comes from me. As competent as you all are, how many of you are competent? Oh, you all are fake, fake humble. It's not about how competent you are. And some of you are competent in something. Some of you are competent at others. The only competency that truly matters is the one that comes from God. Why? Because we're not talking about leaving a good mark on this world. We're talking about leaving a God mark on this world. All your competencies and my competencies, we can do a lot. We can leave a good mark on this world. I can leave a good mark on you by being a competent pastor with my own abilities. But I can't leave a God mark on you by my competencies. That doesn't happen through human competency. It happens through the competency that comes from God. Now, I know that can be hard to believe. That it's not about, oh, your ability to make plans and that's why things around you succeed. That it's actually, if you're going to make a difference, it's based on God's competency. Let me try and just prove it to you with a couple examples from Scripture. Do you remember the story? Jesus was with his disciples and they were watching people going into the temple. And they were watching these wealthy people walk in and just drop their bags of money. Like, wow, they're having an impact in the world. That's giving a lot. 
And then this old widow comes by with just barely two pennies and drops them in. And what did Jesus say? She's given more than anybody because her gift was everything she had. Their gift was a small percentage. Her gift was everything, demonstrating a real faith in God, saying, my competency is not in my bank account. It's in my faithfulness and my generosity. And Jesus commended her. She got his letter of recommendation. Think about Moses. Moses didn't talk so good. He stuttered. And he felt really insecure about that. And he's like, I can't be your leader, God. I can't lead your people out of captivity. Listen to the way I talk. How could I be a leader? And God says, it's not about your competency. And God used him to be the greatest leader God's people have ever known, short of Jesus. It's not about your competency. Moses got God's letter of approval, not because he talked so good, but because he was faithful and gave and did what God called him to do, gave himself to it. Think about the apostles, ragtag fishermen, tax collectors. No one would have chosen them to lead a movement of God to change the world. Who does Jesus give his letter to? Them. Throughout Scripture, remember the Old Testament series we've been doing these last few years, going through Abraham's life, uh, Isaac's life, Jacob, and then this past year, Joseph, the past few months ago? Remember what we saw, how God keeps choosing the weak, keeps choosing the younger? Why? Because it's not about the capabilities that you have. It's not about the competencies that the world cherishes. It's about those who will be faithful to God and work with the competency he gives us because he's not interested in things on paper. He's interested in writing things in our hearts by the Spirit. Some of us sitting in this room right now are proud and arrogant based on letters. And we need Jesus to confront us about the things we're putting our pride and our confidence in. Others of us are needlessly worried and down on ourselves because our competencies don't measure up with the people around us. And we look at that as a sign that we're not as good and therefore God can't use us. And we are wasting away competencies God wants to give us because we're measuring ourselves by these other competencies. God wants to work through us. It's not about whether we have faults or not. God's going to be magnified through us when we surrender ourselves to him, faults and all. Learn from God's word today. Stop putting confidence in your competence. Stop being ashamed of your lack of competence. Ask God for his competence to minister his spirit, life, everywhere you go. You don't need a certain IQ score. You don't need a certain credit score. You don't need a certain social score. Those are out there, by the way, to be used by God. Put your life in his hands. He will give you the competence you need to impact the lives of people around you in an eternal way. He'll turn you into someone he can use to write on people's hearts. He'll turn you from someone who looks good on paper to someone who actually does good. Well, how do I get Jesus' letter of recommendation? I stop obsessing about looking good on paper, about my competencies. I focus on receiving his through the Spirit. That's how. That's how I receive Jesus' letter. But why would I want Jesus' letter of recommendation? Why is that one the one I should focus on the most? Why is that one the one I should care about the most? Why should I pursue that and forget all others? Why can't I be proud of a life that's just, you know, healthy and wealthy? Why can't I be proud of a life where, say, I earn a Nobel Peace Prize? Can I be proud of that life? Why can't I be proud of a life that raises a couple good kids that aren't knuckleheads and they do good? Can I be proud of that life? Isn't that enough? Can I be proud if I do well in this world? Maybe I invent something that makes people's lives easier. Can I be proud of that life? All those things are good things. But none of them can do what the gospel does. They can't do what the gospel does. And so even if you and I achieve all of those things, but don't live a life that ministers the gospel, we are not living a life we can be proud of. We are not living a life that has eternal impact. Let Paul explain it to us, starting in verse 7. So go to verse 7. Paul explains. He says, now, I'll say now, this is going to be a little tough to understand at first. We'll read it, and then I'll explain what's going on. He says, now, if the ministry that brought death was engraved in letters on stone, 
If you're picturing the Ten Commandments, good. That's what he's picturing. If they came with glory so that the Israelites couldn't even look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory, temporary though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory, what was passing, if that came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Okay, so so some of the background here. He's talking about when Moses was going up on that mountain and receiving from God, God's law for Israel. So it's the Ten Commandments and all the other laws. Whenever Moses came out from God's presence, his face radiated with God's glory so brightly that the people couldn't look at him. They, they asked him, please put on a veil. Cover your face because it's too much for us to bear. And so Moses would have to put on the veil when he was with them. He'd go back into God's presence and he'd take the veil off. That way they were protected. That's how glorious God's law was. The letter. It had God's glory in it. But Paul still, did you notice what Paul called it? He called it the ministry of death. That seems harsh. Ministry of death. He said that it had no power. The only power it had was to bring condemnation because it didn't actually change anyone. It only exposed how sinful we are. It had God's glory, but it was still just a ministry of death because it didn't do anything except expose sin. It couldn't actually change hearts. It's like, imagine you're putting together a complicated piece of furniture and you're not using the instructions, which is typical for some of you. And so you get to the point where you've, you've, you've gone crazy, you think you've got it together, but what you've arrived at looks like something that should be sitting in a dumpster or in the Museum of Modern Art, one or the other, you're not sure. But you've gone through all kinds of machinations to try and get this thing to work together. And it's obviously not right. And so what do you do? You go and you open the rules. You go and open the directions, the law that you were supposed to follow in putting it together. And what does that do for you? It exposes every one of your mistakes. Can it undo what you've done? That leg you cut in half because it obviously is too long. They didn't know what they were doing, so now you've chopped it up. You know, the screws you put in different places, you went and got some bolts of your own. And like, can it undo all of that? No, it can just expose your failures and make it clear how you've ruined it. If laws were capable of changing people, then the United States would have the best people in the world. Do you know how many federal laws we have? Not state laws and regulations, not even city ordinances and laws, just federal laws. Anybody want to even guess? I, I know you don't know. Do you know how I know you don't know? Because nobody knows. They've tried, I went to the Library of Congress. I wanted to, to see, is there a number? There, no one knows. There's been different attempts to try and count them. Um, one I read about was uh, this guy named Ronald Gaynor back in the 80s, part of the Justice Department, set out and probably what was the most exhaustive attempt. And at the end of it, he gave up. And this is what he said. He said, you'd have to die and resurrect three times, and you still wouldn't have an answer to this question about how many laws and regulations we have. Do you know what? I remember I was reading about blogging a couple years back, and you know, observations about the blog posts that get the most clicks and everything. Do you know which headlines often get the most clicks? The ones that say X number of rules to accomplish X. So it's seven rules to lose that belly fat by swimsuit season. You know, five rules to make your marriage healthy and happy. Those are the ones that everybody clicks on and wants to know more. Twelve simple steps to be a millionaire by the time you're 30. I'm 53, too late. (laughs) We are obsessed with rules on paper and laws. We're constantly looking for the right combination of rules and laws and things that can unlock the life we want for ourselves and unlock the life we want for our societies. But laws on paper, or even laws carved in stone, don't change you and me. I don't care how serious you are about quitting that habit. 
You can make all the best rules and you can have perfect rules and perfect guidelines for yourself. They're not gonna make you change that habit. You can have all the perfect rules for that thing you wanna start doing. They're not gonna make you start doing it. The flaw isn't in the rules. The flaw isn't in the law. The flaw is in our hearts. And what we need is a heart change. And here's Paul's point. If the law that God gave Moses couldn't change hearts, could only expose our guilt, but if that law had glory, how much more glorious is what Jesus has done where he has made it possible for our hearts to actually change so that we don't even need laws. We just do what God created us to do. We love the way he created us to love. We behave like our perfect father. If the old law came with glory that people couldn't bear to look at, how much more glorious is Jesus? Is the gospel? Is this new covenant that you and I get to minister? The gospel is more glorious than any of those things written on paper or typed in computers because it can actually change our hearts. A lot of you have children, and most of you have been children at some point. When children are young, you need to tell them what to do, don't you? Here's what, every little thing. Here's what to do, what not to do. You desperately teach them the rules. Look both ways before crossing the street. Don't play in traffic. Don't put things in that little electrical socket. Don't drink the juice that we keep under the kitchen sink. All these rules that you have to put in place because they're stupid, they don't know anything. Imagine if you kept having to do that in their 20 and their 30. You expect them at some point to take these rules to heart and now for themselves choose what is right and what is good because their hearts have now understood and changed. That's what maturity is supposed to be. And that's when you start to relax. They don't need you to make tons of rules around everything for them because their hearts are starting to get it. It's similar with us. We need someone to help us become spiritually mature so that we don't need rules to help us stop engaging in death. (laughs) But we have God's spirit and he keeps us from wanting to engage in anger or unforgiveness or sexual immorality or debauchery or drunkenness or gossip or any of these things. We have Jesus to change our hearts so that we spiritually begin to mature and our appetites change. Laws and rules don't make my heart change. The Holy Spirit makes my heart change. Jesus died so you and I could be forgiven and washed clean and receive the Spirit of God so that our hearts can change. That's why Jesus' letter of recommendation is the one you want because Jesus' letter of recommendation comes for a life and a ministry that is involved in actually changing hearts, not just trying to make rules to make the best life we can to get by, but something that actually brings life. Life change, eternal life change. So we want Jesus' recommendation above all others. And we get it, not because of our competencies, but because we surrender ourselves to him and we're faithful and we operate out of God's competencies. Now Paul's gonna give at the end here, A picture of what the church should be like. This is the kind of church we want to be. In Moses' day, and worship team, if you would start to make your way up just slowly. In Moses' day, only Moses had God's glory. In Moses' day, only Moses' face was the one that shined. In Moses' day, only Moses got to speak to God and have that relationship with God. And all the people, they couldn't bear it. He had to wear a veil so it wouldn't bother them so they could bear to be around him after he'd been in God's presence, even though that was just a small and fading portion of God's glory. But now, because of Jesus, I want you to see what Paul tells us happens. Go to verse 16. There are no more veils. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's all of us. When is it? When I get my act together? No, it's when you turn to the Lord. That veil's taken away. You're able to be in his glory, experience his glory. Who? Who gets qualified for this? Anyone who does what? Turns to the Lord. Whenever anyone 
turns to the Lord. You might feel like, oh, it's too late for me. No, 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 no. Whenever. You might feel like I've done too much. No, no, no. Anyone who turns to the Lord, that veil is removed, and now you see God's glory. You get to experience God's glory in Jesus. He goes on, verse 17, and he points out, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom to what? Freedom not to do whatever I want. (laughs) Freedom to enter into God's glory. Freedom to enter into God's presence, to experience his presence in a powerful way. Freedom to, to live and move and not be like, oh, I can't handle God's presence, but to actually move in God's presence and experience it and live with it and minister to others so that he writes on other people's hearts through you. When Jesus died, that veil, do you remember what happened? The veil that separated the Holy of Holies in the temple? The Holy of Holies was where God's presence touched the earth. That veil tore in two from top to bottom. Like God was saying, the veil is gone. Jesus now has made a new and living way into God's presence. Freedom. Freedom to enter into God's presence. Not to be stuck in the quagmire of sin and guilt and shame that you and I live in so often and frustration and anxiety and all these things. Freedom to enter in boldly into God's presence and find the grace and the help that we need in our times of need. But wait, as beautiful as that is, the last verse to me is the most beautiful thing. Verse 18, he says, and now we all, all of us, with unveiled faces, contemplate, reflect the Lord's glory. And we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This is what the church is meant to be. Picture how this is flipped in Paul's mind. We're all a bunch of Moseses now. People who have been in God's presence, who experience God's presence. And what do we do? We take the veil off. We don't have to wear a veil around each other. We now reflect God's glory off of our faces into each other's eyes. And all of us just together soak it in. This is what the church should be. God's glory bouncing off of your face into my eyes, off of my face into your eyes, and all of us encouraging each other. And what happens is we all reflect God's glory to each other. We begin to become more and more like him. We all get transformed. Not me in my alone quiet time, just me and Jesus, and he's making me like him. I don't know about that person. No, it's all of us, all of us with unveiled faces reflecting his glory to each other, helping each other by shining his glory into each other's faces, helping each other be transformed into his image, making us more and more glorious. Do you want to be glorious? Not on paper glorious. In practice glorious. Not resume glorious, but the impact you're having on the lives of the people around you glorious. I become Christ's letter of recommendation for you. You become Christ's letter of recommendation for me. We all become Christ's letter of recommendation for each other because we're all reflecting his glory. You can be proud of a life that reflects God's glory. We can be proud of being a church that reflects God's glory.